Good evening and good morning. Good afternoon, wherever you may be in the world. Um, I'm Vinita Shetty, the um, founder of uh, Smart Citizen, which is a blogosphere uh, based in uh, Barcelona, covering smart cities. And I'm also the convener of uh, Placemaking India, uh, which uh, is part of Placemaking X, uh, with 15 affiliates worldwide. I spent part of the year in uh, the city of Barcelona, um, of which Robert Hughes, the Australian writer, said uh, in talking about the relationship between the city and General Franco, ports are distrusted. Dating from their days of shipping, port cities are too open to the influence of foreigners, to strange and non-native ideas, shifting and labile places offering an ease of entry and exit that a landlocked place does not. The port is where the ser authentique, or essence of a country, as centralizing power imagines it, begins to fray. Karachi and Mumbai are both uh, fishing villages on the Arabian Sea that were, grow to, that were to grow to become the highest populated cities in their country. Spirited and liberal, classy and cosmopolitan, the dreams of millions of lives are made here. They're also the magnet for money, mobsters and movie stars. Fast-paced and hardworking cities with a vibrant night economy. And far from their contentious capital cities, they also realize that religious and ethnic strife are simply bad for business. Even as recently as 1965, ferries operated between the two trading hubs and business savvy communities, Gujarati, Maharashtrian, Parsis, Goan, Sindhis, shuttled back and forth. There was a fluency between the cities. They also had once the cleanest beaches in Asia. And then there was the mutual romance with the monsoon, a romance that turns into a catastrophe every year as heavy rains and high tides paralyze the city. So uh, the same breezes that riffle through my grandfather's apartment in my infancy on Marine Drive blow through Clifton Sea View. Yeah. In so we have the participants in the city, and that will be the focus of our the next hour. Uh, here to introduce and moderate this conversation is uh, Kiran Kalamdani uh, from Kimaya Architects. And uh, yeah. Kiran is, um, um, you know, the uh, actually based in my hometown in, in Pune. He's an architect, urban designer, and heritage conservationist who also writes, engages in activism and education. And he studied architecture at uh, Pune's Bharatiya Kala Prasarani Sabhavidyale and later joined the Delhi School of Planning and Architecture. After working with Mr. K.T. Dravindran on the ghats of Vrindavan and Mathura on the banks of River Yamuna, he completed his master's degree at York, UK, through a scholarship awarded by the Charles Wallace UK Trust. Uh, after returning to India, he founded Kimaya with his partner and wife, Anjali, and together they work on many prestigious conservation projects like Shaniwar Vada, Vishram Bagh, Tulsi Bagh, Council Hall, the architectural illumination of um, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Terminus, Victoria Terminus at Mumbai, and the temples of Neera, Narsingpur, and Bhima Shankar. He's presently working on the Memorial Vada of the Chafekar Brothers at Chinchwad and several other projects for government, individuals, and institutions. So over to you, Kiran, if you could introduce uh, Sali, um, Sunila and PK Das. Uh, I have to yeah. um, also announce that, um, unfortunately, um, you know, Arif Hassan um, had a stroke over the past week and is unable to um, obviously be on this call, but he's very ably represented by Sunila Ahmed, who is his mentee, and uh, she will be... Um, taking us through his presentation. So over to you, Kiran. Yeah, uh, thank you, Vinita. Should I also introduce uh, Professor Arif Hassan along with Sunila? 
Uh, yes, so you could he, do that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, uh, we spoke with him last time when we had a a pre session, and yes. uh, yeah, uh, it's very unfortunate that he cannot join us today. But Arif Hassan is an architect and planner, activist, teacher, researcher, and author of a large number of books, research papers, monographs on urban development issues. He has been the principal consultant to the Orangi Pilot Project Research and Training Institute from 1981 to 2017. He's also a founder chairperson of the Urban Resource Center, Karachi, and a founding member of the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, Bangkok. These projects are being replicated in a number of cities worldwide and have received international recognition. He has also taught at Pakistani and European universities, lectured worldwide, been a member of various UN communities, and his activism had led to the modification of a number of projects and policies in favor of low income communities. He has received a number of national and international awards for his work and writings, including the Hilal A. Imtiaz and the UN. Year for Shelterless Memorial Award. Uh, representing him is Sunila Ahmed, an assistant uh, professor at the NED University of Engineering and Technology. She holds a professional degree in architecture uh, in the year 2000, master's in urban management from the University of Canberra, and a PhD in urban design from Oxford Brookes University, UK. Her doctoral dissertation entitled Understanding Localness of Built Form at the urban scale, investigating Makamiyat in the case of Karachi, Pakistan, assessed what it means for a city to be local in the context of Karachi, being specific, having particular variables impacting the built form, but dealing with similar issues of identity crises as other formerly colonized nations. The research reviewed the correlation between variables of identity, built form, and social practices. Sunila has been involved in local and international urban planning and design researches. She has also participated in national and international conferences and symposia and has authored and contributed to urban and architecture publications. Her interests lie in areas related to public architecture, identify and local global connections of the built form with political, social and economic processes. So over to you, Sunila. Uh, like Thank you. Thank you, uh, Kiran. Um, I will just uh, share my presentation and then start. Um, these are very big shoes that I have been asked to uh, fill in today uh, to present in place of Arif Sahab. But um, I hope I can, I'll, I'll try and do uh, as much uh, justice to it as possible. But um, just bear with me. Okay, can you see my screen? Is it sharing? Yes. Yeah, we can, can see your screen. Thank okay. you very much. Yes. Okay. So uh, I have had a talk with Arif Sahab, and uh, the uh, presentation put together today is basically on his ideas. Um, and uh, they just um, uh, put across his ideas, his principles, and I'm also using uh, some of the photographs, which has be, have been, and maps, which have been. Uh, taken and developed by him. So uh, I have uh, basically I will just go through the outline first um, uh, because it's a it's it's quite a lot that I'm trying to cover, but I will not dwell too much into either of the uh, uh, sections. What I the intention is to give an overview and get a conversation started. So uh, basically, the intervention is uh, uh, sorry the objective is. Um, to outline the intervention in public spaces in Karachi, why infra different infrastructure uh, projects with the vision of placemaking. Uh, depending on the approach, in some cases, this placemaking uh, uh, vision led to gentrification, and in other cases, it led to mobilization and empowerment of the community. So the whole, whole presentation is divided into four sections, uh, which, where I start out with the larger hydrology of the city, um, the beachfront uh, and go on to the beachfront gentrification, the development plans for islands, uh, which will lead to gentrification in case they are implemented. Uh, and lastly, uh, how um, uh, community mobilization and empowerment has actually uh, uh, helped in um, uh, achieving the, the true essence of placemaking. 
So starting out with Karachi's coastline and introduction, it's a 27 kilometer long coastline. And in, new, in addition to numerous creeks and mangrove forests, it is also dotted by ancient fishing villages, um, which is also said to be the uh, uh, origin of Karachi, where Karachi actually originated um, almost uh, 300, 400 years ago. Um, then more than half of it is visited by hundreds of thousands of Karachiites every week for recreation and entertainment, half of this 27 kilometers, because this is the only most accessible beach of the entire country. There are other beaches, but they are not very developed and easily accessible. Um, but after 1999, with, at the turn of the century, uh, attempts, various attempts towards gentrification um, in, with the objective of uh, having Karachi fit in the global agenda and co converting it into a global city, uh, uh, many uh, um, uh, points of access to the beach have been um, blocked off, uh, which I will be um, uh, presenting briefly today. And uh, with, with the vision of creating uh, developments like Dubai or Malaysia, uh, and uh, which are backed by real estate companies and international foreign funding. So this is an image which actually shows that 27 kilometers um, of the uh, coast of Karachi, um, neighboring onto uh, the Arabian Sea. And uh, in this uh, picture, in this image, Google Earth image, I would like you to take a note of two of the markers I placed. One is the Baba Island and one is the Macha Colony, because I will be referring to them and also Clifton, three, three of the markers, uh, because I will be referring to all three of them in my future slides. So. Basically, there is a, um, uh, th this is where Manora is. So you ha we have a lot of backwaters and mangrove plantations uh, within this um, uh, uh, area. And this also happens to be the harbor, uh, the location of the harbor for the city. This map actually shows the existing sewerage and drainage uh, systems in the city. Um, and it shows that uh, we have the treatment plants, uh, different treatment plants located but um, within the city uh, and or before the, uh, the sewerage is uh, actually entering the uh, Arabian Sea, uh, in theory, it should be treated uh, through, uh, via these treatment plants, but in reality, it does not happen that way, which damages the environment and causes a lot of pollu polluted, um, uh, pollution to enter the sea, um, basically because of poor maintenance or either the treatment plants are not working or uh, the, uh, some of the lines actually bypass these treatment plants. This is another um, a map of the city, which as I mentioned earlier, sh actually shows the number of natural nalas and drains that we have. And these nalas and drains are supposed to carry the, the, uh, the rainwater uh, naturally into the sea. But unfortunately, they have not been retained as nalas and uh, open drains over the years. And a lot of different types of encroachment and developments have happened along these nalas and drains, uh, which has again um, negatively impacted the environment and has actually resulted in um, uh, you know, the flooding of the, sea, of the city uh, as a result of the recent um, uh, monsoons which have been happening. Uh, also the, rain, the, num the amount of rain uh, which is happening uh, because of global global warming uh, and global climatic change has also increased. This is uh, these, this slide actually outlines the number of issues related to Nalas of Karachi. It uh, it shows um, uh, two pictures of the um, uh, two blow, uh, blow ups of two localities within uh, the city, where you can actually see the blue uh, uh, are the covered drains and the uh, uh, red ones are the open drains. So majority of the drains have been covered in the city, the open drains which were existed, uh, they have been covered. And what happens is in case there is a blockage or in case there is a, um, uh, there, there is a requirement to clean up these drains, their the accessibility gets blocked. Also because once these drains are covered, then some sort of a construction happens over them or uh, some sort of informal um, uh, informally uh, developed uh, kiosks or vendors would uh, start uh, coming in, sitting over there because it becomes freely available open land. Then at the other end, there is also encroachment happening where uh, 
um, along these nalas, a lot of housing societies spring up. And they're not always low-income housing. A lot of high-income housing also encroaches on these uh, um, uh, nalas. Um, then there is also um, a reclamation of land at the outfall of these nalas, which, uh, which, block, block is, uh, which causes blockages of the outfall areas. And um, because of encroachment, the right of way of the nalas also gets uh, becomes narrow. This is an image which actually uh, is of Clifton, which I mentioned in the earlier Google Earth image. Um, and it's an influential area. It's a um, high income area, uh, all formalized, uh, formally developed housing schemes. Um, but some of the uh, right of way of these nalas, as you can see, and these arrows, the dotted one where it is written PS, um, is actually is um, uh, the area where which has been encroached upon. So obviously, when the uh, natural flow of water is interrupted by these encroachments, um, and they, they, they get converted into uh, housing schemes or plots, which are sold off in the uh, real estate uh, open market. Um, so the, the, the water that uh, is being run off does not find a way to flow um, in these nalas, and it comes out onto the roads, which is the only other natural access, and the city gets flooded. This is another image of Clifton, um, where it shows that uh, the area which was supposed to be the um, outfall of the Nalas gets encroached and a housing scheme or land reclamation and plotting starts happening over there, which again becomes um, a, a big hindrance. And this is where actually mangrove plantations existed. And they have been cut off and the land has been reclaimed and, uh, real and has been converted into um, uh, saleable uh, plots in the open market. This is, um, the, these are actually images of um, um, uh, Butcher Colony, uh, which is which developed as a low income area. So just to give you a, an idea of high and low income um, uh, reclamation of land, that is something which is happening formally. This is something which is happening informally. So these, this, is, uh, this is that estuary that I was talking about and the bay that forms uh, next to the harbor. And this is where the um, low income settlements uh, exist on the first corner uh, uh, in the left. And that is the image of 1985. And the last image on uh, the, uh, at the bottom on the right is 2010. So if uh, a blow up of the square is seen in 1985, it was half mangroves and half uh, um, housing. But by 2010, it has all been encroached upon and all the mangroves are gone and there is only housing. And this informal process um, visually looks like this. This is how the housing starts to happen where debris these are bought in from uh, the other parts of the city. Land is re reclaimed by bit by bit. Uh, plotting starts to happen. Shacks come out and come up, and then these shacks uh, start to uh, consolidate over the years. Now, uh, but the there is difference in the uh, way um, uh, sometimes uh, where uh, rich people are encroaching. Um, this is a, 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 a construction ha which had happened on a, um, a nala in Clifton, um, where the, a wall has been constructed and a, a, a bungalow has been uh, extended uh, and the lawn has been made over it. Uh, whereas in um, a poorer income area, uh, the the um, uh, debris have been uh, pulled out of the nala to let the um, uh, let the water flow through. So there are some um, uh, opposite approaches uh, in different parts of the cities that happen. Now um, uh, moving on um, uh, towards the beach uh, gentrification. Uh, this was actually initiated with uh, General Musharraf coming to power in 1999, where he also appointed the um, uh, Citibank um, uh, chief executive as the finance minister and a World Bank uh, um, uh, senior employee, ex-employee as a governor. And they um, started towards uh, uh, privatization and investment of the beachfront. Now, um, this, this is uh, uh, with Busharov coming to power in 1999. Uh, 2001, there was a devolution plan that was implemented in the city uh, all over Pakistan and obviously in Karachi as well. So Karachi, as a result of this devolution plan, Karachi became an autonomous city district. And um, uh, a lot of uh, international funding uh, started to pour in. 
um, because um, it uh, because the image of the global city was also being pro uh, projected, and um, uh, the beachfront was being um, uh, uh, kind of seen or uh, given a vision of being developed in a certain way, um, which would uh, promote a foreign investment. Um, and with Musharraf coming to power, the security situation was also very stable. So these foreign investors were actually interested in uh, putting money um, into uh, Pakistan. So um, uh, the, uh, of the 27 kilometers that I mentioned earlier, 14 kilometers are act come actually under uh, Defense Housing Authority, uh, which is um, a, a housing authority which was started in the 70s by the army. Um, and then the plots were sold off in the open market. So anybody can now buy a plot there and live there. But it is a very high income area. And of these 14 kilometers, um, uh, there was a proposal uh, made um, which was along the lines of um, uh, six star hotels, clubs, and marinas. And remember, this is actually the beach which is mostly frequented, but not just by Karachiites, but all of people people from all of Pakistan because of its, its accessibility. Um, so um, there were also a number of architects, contractors, and the builders and developer associations who were also involved in the construction design um, and visualization of this beachfront. But there were also a number of opponents, and they included civil society organizations, Worldwide uh, Fund Pakistan, um, uh, World Wildlife Fund Pakistan, uh, National Sindh and Karachi-based fishermen organizations, because obviously when uh, land is reclaimed for such development and the, uh, the access to the beach is blocked off, then the entire ecology changes and it impacts the lives of fishermen. Trade unions uh, through the, the Pakistan Institute of Labor Education and Research, they were very active. Um, they were, uh, URC was engaged in it also, uh, Urban Resource Center Karachi. Um, there were a number of low-income schools and CBOs from all over Singh who were also uh, engaged in different ways of advoc advocacy and protest. Uh, the academia was very active. There was a, a strong role of the media and some corporate uh, concerned citizens and some uh, co concerned corporate heads of this uh, city. Now, this is um, this is that DHA beach that I'm talking about, uh, and uh, it takes it curves around um, this uh, projection. And um, these are the points marked over here, which were actually where, which resulted in the removal of the hawkers who used to um, be present over here and were a very intrinsic part of the quality of the space on the beach. So um, they they were removed because now a different a type of development was envisaged. And this is the type of development that was envisaged. And this is the image over here actually shows the land that was reclaimed um, and uh, uh, developed into housing. And a very upscale Dubai-like image, which had really no identical uh, connection in terms of identity uh, with the city. Um, some of the other uh, interventions that were done on the beach were uh, also where these international food franchises were bought, the trucks were bought, uh, uh, and uh, they were uh, stationed on the beach. And that local flavor uh, was uh, uh, quite done away quite a lot. This is what the local flavor looked like or looks like still today, um, which is away from that 14 kilometers of DHA beach on the rest of the beach, uh, where um, people just come there, sit there, have a cup of tea, have a uh, ice cream, would take a picture, uh, take pictures with Indian um, uh, stars or ride a beach buggy or ride a camel. But this is not what was part of the placemaking, which was ex being executed, so-called placemaking, which was being executed by um, the developers and um, the um, decision makers on the DHA, uh, the, uh, Defense Housing Authority coastline. And then there was a very big beach park that was developed, which is um, which uh, unfortunately remained very, um, um, you know, very perfect and organized and uh, perhaps visually pleasing for some of some onlookers. But these uh, stakeholders who once used to be on this land uh, were actually uh, kicked out and would then sit outside these um, uh, boundary walls. So because they need to earn their money as well and they need a source of income. So they, they did exist. They did come back eventually after being evicted from those areas. Um, and they started uh, sitting on the um, uh, on the outside of the boundary walls. 
Now, uh, the, the, the vision that the Eche coastline uh, um, uh, promoted was, I will just read out these lines in red. Um, in Karachi, DHA has a virgin unspoiled waterfront of nearly 14 kilometers, ready with full potential of development. They will soon have access, the residents will soon have access to multiple recreational activities within their beach. So this is, and with five-star hotels, private segments of the beach, and a private beach with lagoon for hotels and residential blocks. So there was a lot of hue and cry uh, with, when, these projects, when these projects were uh, publicized or uh, advertised in the media and in the newspaper, and um, they will talk about uh, DHA violation, the doctrine of public trust, um, uh, the violation uh, of the Environmental Protection Act 1997, uh, the, uh, of the violation of the Sin government, notification of 1975, the Article 9 of the Constitution, its overall effect on the fishing community, on the livelihoods of the people who were actually part of this beachfront for many, many years, and the hawkers and jugglers and the monkey wallas, uh, the um, you know the uh, snake charmers and all of those other stakeholders who were very much part of the beach but now had to be evicted because of this um, uh, new image that was being promoted for the beachfront. A uh, similar kind of gentrification was envisaged and um, in uh, for the islands. Um, again, the, uh, uh, I will show you the image again over here. This is Baba Island, right in the center of this image, and you can see another small island next to it, which is Bundal Bundal Island. These are uh, uh, these are uh, vernacular uh, fishermen communities, and they have been living and working over here uh, since even before Karachi was formed. Um, there was a, a project that was um, initiated about evicting them and giving it out to some Dubai-based firm for making hotels and resorts. Uh, but because of the um, hue and cry raised by the civil society and different um, organizations, uh, their project was shelved. But now recently, uh, unfortunately, Imran Khan's government is again talking about um, evicting uh, and uh, these uh, fishermen and making something um, uh, similar and fancy uh, over here. So this is what the people on the livelihoods of the people on the island looks like, where they are into fishing and have their trawlers, they're into net making, and they are into boat making as well. Uh, and obviously, it's a very, it's a um, uh, developed society where they also, if they're not fishermen, then they engage in uh, any other form of trade and um, activity. Uh, the objections around these were again similar to the ones around uh, which were raised uh, with respect to the uh, development of the beach, and these were around um, the uh, damage to the environment, damage to the society, uh, damage to the stakeholders, non-inclusiveness of the stakeholders, loss of heritage, uh, both social and physical heritage. And Fisher, Fisher, Pakistan Fisher Folk community was very active, um, and they also protested. Uh, and the next slide actually shows their protect, protest uh, on land and in the sea. So they also took out a rally in the beach um, against the, these, uh, these um, uh, proposals. Uh, so the objections were articulated by civil society, by various stakeholders, prominent citizens, corporate sectors, OPP and URC both carried out this, uh, these uh, protests and uh, many architects, activists and um, uh, 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 responsible citizens, I would call them, also pa a joint part of these um, uh, protests. There were also some shutdown strikes that were observed. Uh, and then as a result of all of this hue and cry, uh, so this is the image of the um, different protests that happened as a result of these. So as a result of all this hue and cry, um, there, uh, there was a, a clause included in the strict Karachi Strategic Development Plan 2020, which actually um, prevented um, any such development. And th these are some important clauses, which I will quickly read out. While the opposition to the project was being uh, raised, the K KSDP plan was being made. The issues were discussed in the meetings, and there was a stakeholder meeting in which Arif Hassan also participated. Um, and these uh, concerns were raised by him very actively. Um, and these as a result of which, these clauses were included. The flora and fauna of the area fishing community, lower and lower income Karachiites, are who flock to the beaches and the person to serve them and land owning agencies and people are all were all accepted as stakeholders. 
under the KSDP, no reclamation from the sea, mangrove marshes, mud flats, which were which have fish, turtle, and other um, uh, species. Uh, uh, they were uh, they were not allowed to be disturbed, and the beach uh, the beaches should be accessible to the fishing communities and to the public. And no um, development would happen uh, beyond 150 um, uh, uh, before 150 meters mark from the high tide. So um, these were so so um, in terms of um, uh, advocacy, uh, these um, uh, uh, the placemaking, although it was not happening physically, but these they were successful. Um, uh, the placemaking in its truest sense did not happen it's, uh, successfully by the protest by um, the, the different communities and uh, so civil society, but they were able to actually um, have these clauses and these policies included in the bylaws and uh, the uh, development plan. Um, where placemaking was very successful in terms of uh, community initiative and empowerment was the Orangi pilot project. And I'm sure uh, many of you are all already aware of it, which again um, is, uh, was a brainchild of Dr. Akhtar Hamid Khan, but was uh, led um, on ground by um, uh, OPP, uh, Orangi Pilot Project, which was headed by Arif Hassan um, for, the, for a very long time, and then uh, um, uh, by Parveen Brahman. Uh, so it was about uh, partnership between the people and the government, um, strengthening community initiatives, um, appointing um, a local representative from each name and connecting them with the community with the government local level government representatives in order to achieve a successful um, drainage pro uh, 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 program uh, drainage implementation for the society for the whole of Orangi uh, which had a lot of outfalls and resulted in um, the general upgradation of the neighborhood and general uh, improvement in the living conditions in terms of social uh, conditions as well as economic conditions and obviously physical conditions. So um, this is what Orangi uh, look, looks like um, today. It is, a, it is, um, uh, it is uh, the biggest uh, low income area um, within Pakistan. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, community uh, interaction uh, or, uh, with the um, citizen scientists were, were appointed uh, for each um, lane and they were uh, used to approach different houses, uh, bring the people on board and community-led uh, initiatives were um, channeled uh, through people like Arif Hassan and other, um, uh, other um, responsible architects and planners um, who uh, joined together, had these regular meetings, and eventually um, achieved a, um, a successful project where the entire society, um, having a population of um, uh, uh, one uh, lakh, uh, people residing in them uh, had houses with proper drainage systems. Um, so basically, uh, in the end, I would just like to read out um, uh, uh, what an uh, oath that Arif Hassan took in 1983 for himself. And before I do that, I would just like to say that architects and planners have played an important role in developing a very large number of anti-poor uh, projects, which is very unfortunate. And um, uh, if, if we as um, architects or planners um, you know, put up a stand and say um, that we will not engage in such professions and as Arif Hassan advocates, that an oath of poor architects and planners, something similar to the Hippocratic oath, which is taken by medical professionals, they should also take an at the time of graduation. Um, and he has also um, uh, ad, uh, done advocacy related to this uh, with the Council of Architects uh, in Pakistan. And this is something which he has uh, an oath he took himself and uh, abides by it uh, uh, till today. I will not do projects that will irreparably, irreparably damage the ecology and the environment of the area in which they are located. I will not do projects that increase poverty, dislocate people, and destroy the tangible and intangible cultural heritage of communities that live in the city. I will not do projects that destroy multi-class public space and violate building bylaws and zoning regulation. And I will always object to insensitive projects that do, um, do all this provided I can offer viable alternatives. I think if we all abide by these um, uh, regulations, um, we can actually end up having very equitable uh, city. Thank you.
unmute. Hello, yeah. Uh, thank you, Sunila. I think that was uh, very interesting, showing the dichotomy, you know, between two worlds, you know, that exists probably uh, in all developing nations. Uh, I think you brought out the contrast wonderfully. And thank you for ending on that positive note. You know, the oath is something probably uh, Vinita was, Uta was asking me, do architects in India take any such oaths? And uh, uh, PK Das will bear me out by saying that obviously there is no such oath that is taken, but uh, I think we would like to you to share that oath so that you know it's taken by all our uh, architects and planners and urban designers who, who are there. Uh, I think we have time for this discussion later on, but uh, we will move to the next presentation, which is by uh, PK Das. PK Das uh, uh, is our friend and popularly known as an architect activist. His priority has been to establish a very close relation between architecture and people by involving them in a participatory planning process while critically responding to the cry for a sustainable ecology. His wide spectrum of work includes organizing slum dwellers for better living and evolving affordable housing models, engaging in policy framework for public housing, reclaiming public spaces, including developing the waterfronts, protection and conservation of natural areas, re-envisioning the city of Mumbai alongside an architectural practice involving urban planning, urban design, architecture, and interior design assignments across India. He has authored several books and publications and has delivered talks and lectures across the world. His work in the development of Mumbai's coastline and his slum rehabilitation projects has won him several national and international awards, including the first Urban Age Award instituted by the London School of Economics and the Deutsche Bank, conferred to the Mumbai Waterfront Center, of which Das is the chairperson. He has also been conferred with the prestigious first International Jane Jacobs Medal of 2016. So uh, here we are, uh, PK, uh, over to you. Thank you, Kiran. Um, thank you, Vinita, for inviting me. Um, I was really eagerly looking forward to, to listening to the great Arif Hassan and hear from him uh, about his thoughts, his work, um, which is, which are, some of them are really landmarks. Um, we are sad that he couldn't join us and that he's had a stroke and we only hope that he recovers very soon. Um, thank you, Sunila, for having presented um, wonderfully some of the thoughts that Arif has uh, been working with and championing and you put them forward so well. Uh, thank you, Sunila, for that. Um, thank you. As for me, um, <clears throat> you know, Vinita talked about how much Mumbai and Karachi are liberal cities. And I really wonder today uh, as to what that liberal city really means. So the people in these cities uh, are liberally uh, doing and thinking and acting upon? Uh, that's a big question mark. Maybe liberalism is to be rethought and redefined in the context of Mumbai and Karachi experiences, Vinita. But that's another subject and we can go to that later. Um, I'm going to be uh, talking today primarily about relationships. And um, the relationships between people and collectively with nature. That, that's my concern. That's the topic of my talk today. Uh, and how much have these relationships developed or have uh, not developed uh, adequately, leading to uh, critical conditions of climate change uh, or climate catastrophe, if I may say so that we so frequently experience that's just threatening our lives, uh, the very lives and our existence. So I'm really going to focus about relationships. For me, um, ecology um, includes both people and nature. The two are inextricably entwined. And the recognition of this symbiotic relationship is critical to our understanding of the current state of our ecology and its future. 
and actions that we would then pursue to shape and decide its future. Sadly, this relationship has been severe over time. Our governments and various development agencies uh, have continued to attack and systematically destroy natural habitats. No, no, Raj, just go back, please. I'll, I'll change them when I tell you. Go back. Go back, please. Um, hold on. I'll tell you when to change, Raj. Yeah, Raj, just hold on. I'll tell you when to change the slides. I'm sorry, I'm challenged by these technology and I requested uh, one of the architects in my office to help me change these slides. Um, I'm unable to do them personally. So sadly, as I said, this relationship between people and nature, uh, for that matter, between people, uh, has, been, has been strange. And in fact, our collective relationship with nature has been severed. Our governments and various development agencies have continued to attack nature and systematically destroy the natural habitats. This is, this is the crux of the issue. And how do we reclaim them? How do we restore them? How do we conserve them? But the government's response to people has been no different either. Polarization of people on the basis of caste, religion, faith, gender continues to be reinforced by the day. And that's probably the extent of liberalism that we are talking about. Uh, today, we stand sharply divided. Our cities are divided. An intense state of violence has formed our way of life and of defining our way of life in cities and over across nations, uh, across borders. And this is leading most people to conditions of underdevelopment in which more and people are denied access to, uh, access to resources, in fact, to their rights, including right to continue to live, right of existence. We are experiencing increasingly a world of uncivilized people and places, if I may say so. Primarily because of these strange relationships that are emerging. What we are there for, what I'm therefore deeply concerned about is the constant division of our cities into such disparate fragments, both in social and spatial terms. Now let's take a look at the case of Mumbai. Raj, turn the slides, please. Yeah, a city on the water, as much as Karachi is. And, and I must, um, um, Sunila, thank you uh, to having gone through many of the issues that we are also grappling with in Mumbai and in India. Um, and I'm sure this is, these are issues are common to many, many uh, cities and nations um, as, we have, as we see and hear them uh, and the struggles that are uh, raging world over. Um, and if I miss out any details, please recall Sunila's presentations that beautifully fills up some of the details that I would not be going through uh, uh, for, you know, for focusing on the subject of my paper and for the limited time that I have. In Mumbai, sadly, I mean, the, these slides show the kind of richness of the natural habitats or the natural conditions that exist in Mumbai, a city on the water indeed. Next slide, please. In Mumbai, tragically, we have turned our backs to the water and our incredible coastline of the city, which runs over uh, 60 kilometers. We have continued to treat the waterfronts, water courses and water bodies as the dumping ground of the city, both physically and metaphorically. Indiscriminate landfilling, destruction of the natural areas that include the creeks, rivers, wetlands, mangrove, forest, hills, etc., are being continued unabatedly. Now, why I need to mention all of these natural habitats and areas is because there is a very deep relationship of each of these elements of nature, uh, including water, whether they be the creeks or the rivers or the hills or the forests or the mangroves or the wetlands. Next slide, please. Sadly, neither has the vast extent of the 150 square kilometers, close to 150 square kilometers of the natural areas have been considered in the planning and development program of Mumbai. 
they've just been excluded from the develop the so-called development plan that's prepared every 20 years for the Mumbai city by the municipal corporation and the state government. Now this slide on the left illustrates the richness of the natural areas of the city. And you can see over 300 kilometers of water courses, which were natural water courses at one time, which have now been turned into dirty, stinking nullahs of the city, where we let our garbage, solid waste and drains into them for draining them into the seas, untreated. So you have this very rich extent of natural areas. And neither have the vast extent of the, um, yeah. Now, uh, so, so that's, the, that's the context in which I'm really talking about. So what's our way forward? How do we move forward in terms of establishing this relationship that I started talking about, that is relationship between people and them collectively with nature? And how can we reclaim that relationship? For me, that's the fight or the struggle that continues um, uh, at, at all levels across the world. Can you move to the next slide, please? So I, uh, in my way forward, I suggest to look at just uh, three aspects. One is the issue pertaining to integration and unification, which is the first uh, issue that I'm going to talk about, integration and unification. The second that I'm talking about is neighborhood-based bottom-up planning process as a way forward to city planning. Um, and the third, which is um, the topic that I'm talking about uh, in our effort towards moving forward, uh, is the re-envisioning of cities. Uh, these are the three points, which I'll very briefly kind of uh, illustrate before you through some of the Mumbai examples and in the Mumbai context. Um, now, integration of the natural areas and, and the unification of people and nature is undoubtedly of utmost priority to us. And this we have experienced through some of specific movements in Mumbai of residents of local area people in reclaiming their, uh, their seafronts, for example, here in this illustration in a sub Western suburb of Mumbai called Bandra. Uh, and you can see some of the slides on the left of what it was before and what it has been turned into a, 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 an unbarricaded open public space that allows um, free movement um, interaction between all classes of people without any restriction. And this has led to many spontaneous engagements, uh, both formal and informal engagements at the level of the local area uh, people, uh, including influencing that of the city, uh, which has in fact been examples, uh, which has led to uh, similar movements across the city. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we have to essentially work towards turning these abused backyards of people and natural habitats into what I call are the proud forecourts. So these over the years, uh, unfortunately have been turned into our backyards, as I said, uh, for dumping and uh, for disposal of our waste and debris. Um, and we have therefore excluded them also from the planning process. And the struggle is to convert and to turn around these backyards into proud social and cultural forecourts of the city. So people can begin to engage uh, with these spaces and places and uh, which intermingle with the kind of richness of the natural uh, assets that we have uh, in the city. Um, with these two slides, this is a slide of another neighborhood uh, in Bandra, another area which is called the Carter Road. And you can see the slides on the left of what it was, the extent of abuse and neglect to what it is on the right. And I must say here that these have been possible through active collective engagement of the neighborhood people, uh, which forced the government, the local uh, authorities, the municipal corporation and the state government to finally extend support, uh, both legally and otherwise. 
even though financially they refuse to recognize and support these movements. Uh, I then move on to the next point uh, after the point about integration uh, is the neighborhood-based bottom-up planning process. Can you move to the next slide, please? Uh, this is yet another area in Bandra, which uh, happens to be a hill slope or a hill, uh, a heritage precinct in, in the neighborhood, which had been destroyed by a five-star hotel, a neighboring five-star hotel. And after a long struggle of the residents of the area, uh, including legal battles in, in up to the Supreme Court, uh, the, the land was uh, reclaimed and restored, including its vegetation of thousands of palm trees that once existed were replanted. And today, probably uh, it's the only cultural square on the waterfront um, or, or a cultural or a plaza anywhere on the waterfront uh, in the city of Mumbai, uh, other than, of course, the plaza uh, at the Gateway of India, which also were developed um, uh, in which I participated through INTAC. Uh, so I then move on to the next slide, which is really taking you to the next subject or the point that I'm making is about neighborhood-based bottom-up planning process. Um, for me, demonstrating change through collective effort has been uh, a primary uh, objective. Uh, for we need to bring about, we need to demonstrate change in order to gain confidence, uh, enhance participation, and draw the attention of the decision makers and planners in the city and the city authorities to recognize the fact that it is only through people's participation that real change can be effected. And these can only happen through these huge collective efforts. And the experiences of the movements that gain through these collective engagements also is, an is also a big lesson in the history of the movement of citizens and participatory uh, processes. Now here's a poster about yet another neighborhood in Mumbai, a col another coastal neighborhood of Mumbai, where the iconic Juhu beaches that you see on the left edge of the slide on the poster or the illustration. Uh, and this is a public campaign poster that we had brought out when we were talking about this idea of neighborhood-based bottom-up planning process. And we were out to demonstrate in an area of four square kilometers of the neighborhood of Juhu that how the citizens and the, uh, and the stakeholders across their interests, whether they were hotels or institutions or educational um, institutions, um, just cooperative societies, the slum dwellers, the fishing communities in the area, that they could all participate in defining what could be and what should be the, the plan for their area. In a sense that the people must re-envision their neighborhood. And that was an effort through this exercise in Juhu. So here's an interesting post that really sort of were pasted all across during our campaign. And then subsequently a book too was brought out explaining Vision Juhu uh, plan uh, to, the, to the entire neighborhood. And we went ahead in executing some parts of this master plan or the plan. I mean, I, I won't use the word master plan, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the, the neighborhood plan or the people's plan. Uh, and we did succeed to a certain extent, uh, which I'll turn the slides on a bit later. Uh, maybe soon after, Raj, you could turn this slide. So therefore, the active participation of people in the decision-making process is fundamental to placemaking or to city building. Uh, it is a bottom-up process instead of a top-down model that we are often subject to, not committed to, but subject to, uh, which are trusted upon by the city authorities and the governments, uh, by sometimes even importing planners and architects uh, from other countries um, and without any participation of the local citizen. So really one of the efforts through such campaign and movements is to bring back the culture of public dialogue, uh, which to me is a very significant democratic endeavor uh, or tenet of democracy. And, and therefore to arouse a dialogue, to, to be able to open up space provide an open space that sort of conjures or facilitates 
public dialogue. That means it enhances participation and allows local people to participate for the local people know best about their area. And so that is, and here is a slide of some of the newspaper coverages and photographs of the Vision Jew movement that took place, uh, agitations, protests, strikes, spaces that have been taken over by developers and builders to build private uh, clubs in lands reserved for uh, public spaces or parks and gardens were then reclaimed through this effort. And some of these spaces were then turned around as significant public spaces. So therefore, as a matter of fact, the undertaking of plans and projects would bring about significant social and environmental change to my mind and have to be led only through people's movements. Therefore, I refer to these projects really as movements and not projects. In order to effectively, next slide please, in order to effectively implement the bottom-up model that I'm talking about and achieve maximum participation, it is prudent to undertake neighborhood-based city planning. That's the big point and that I'm making, that we break down these top-down models of planning. The, those are the, the big master plans that are thrusted down and really a network, a whole series of these neighborhood plans envisioned by the neighborhood people that could then be probably brought together at a citywide dialogue, forming a vision uh, for the city. And for, because the neighborhood people know best about their area, as I said earlier, Otherwise, they are alienated forever from our experience from these big top-down uh, city vision plans. Next, please. And here you see very quickly through three slides the, the kind of demonstration of the change that was possible in Juhu area, where on the top, um, um, we, we have, that Sunila showed a whole network of Nallas in Mumbai, it's interesting, Mumbai has over 300 kilometers of rivers and nallas, which were the original watercourses of the estuary. And we've turned all of them into these dirty, stinking drains that you can see on the top. And to worsen that situation, the corporation went ahead in building these impervious concrete walls along its edges, thereby completely severing the ecological relationships between water and land and water and people. And, and then we intervened in the area to reclaim the water courses, uh, treat the waters of the, uh, of the stinking dirty nallas and turn them around by, by a pythoroid, uh, you know, a biological process. Uh, and we turned some of the spaces alongside, uh, including networking with, with neighborhood public parks, et cetera, to developing a whole network of public spaces. So to me, these networking of public spaces is essentially an idea about networking people. And that's what we are aspiring to do in order to build those relationships uh, that I initially started talking about as being our primary objective or the key focus of my paper and my presentation today. Relationships between people who begin to engage in these spaces and then people collectively with nature in understanding the values of nature in understanding how important these integrations are indeed important for our very lives and existence. So the active participation, uh, so therefore I go, in order to effectively implement these bottom-up model and achieve maximum participation, it is prudent to undertake these neighborhood planning processes that I talked about. Now through a neighborhood plan, can you change this slide please to the next one? Through a neighborhood-based development approach, it is possible to decentralize, and this is extremely important, and localize projects, thus breaking away from the monolithic planning and design ideas that are disconnected from most people and often serve the interests of the few, not the many. Master plans for the cities are generally top-down models drafted by elite groups and fail to engage with citizens on, on their ideas. Importantly, such neighborhood-based transformations, these illustrations that I showed you across, whether it's Gateway of India or Bandra or Juhu, and many, many other neighborhoods across Mumbai could never have been envisioned in the so-called master plans of the city. 
the top-down planning processes. So that is also why these movements for neighborhood-based planning is so significant in the effort towards re-envisioning our cities. I think the next most important aspect that we need to talk about is popularization of plans and these movements. For often we are very shy of presenting alternatives and, and demonstrating alternatives. And they can only be demonstrated effectively if they are popularized. So it's a political movement, finally. Finally, this effort of neighborhood planning, this effort to reunite people, to bring about public dialogue, to integrate nat natural habitats with our desired development objectives and aspirations is essentially an effort that can be that can be affected through popularization of ideas. Uh, today, very hearteningly, next slide please, hundreds of people flock these areas every day. It has impacted the neighborhood life and that of the city. Importantly, people relate to these spaces in their daily life experiences in the city. So it's not a central park that you go to, which is you need to drive into a walk or cycle and reach a few kilometers to reach a destination of a central park, but an idea of miles of linear parks that begin to redefine the idea of decentralization. I will now go to the last point of my, of my presentation. Next slide, please. Which is really focusing on the need for re-envisioning our, our cities. It is necessary for me to re-envision cities in order to elevate the quality of life and environment that we are being subject to, sadly. The fast deteriorating quality of life and environmental conditions. Networking of people and places that includes the natural assets is an effective democratic tool for the achievement of this objective. Connecting the dots or the various individual neighborhood movements is the way forward for preparing city plans. Sole objective bring to bring about significant social and environmental change through connected places and people through connecting places and people. In this networking of people and uh, places and people across boundaries and the conservation, restoration, and integration of water, water bodies and water courses, along with all of the natural areas are indeed important. At a political level, our struggles are against the rapidly expanding phenomenon of segregation, of exclusivity, discrimination against the abuse, misuse, and colonization of public resources and exclusionary city planning. Our fight is for networking and integration, for equality, environmental justice, and the democratization of ecology. That is the sense of our struggle. In conclusion, I would like to say that the reason of success or failure in the democratization of ecology through the making of places or place making as this um, forum uh, sort of uh, wishes to propagate is measured as for me by the extent of relationship that develops or does not develop between people across multiple boundaries of divide and collectively their relationship with nature. That is the conclusion that I would like to end with. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, PK. I think that was a wonderful presentation and extremely valid uh, points raised uh, through your presentation uh, because uh, it is extremely important that people talk to each other, people understand each other and people respect each other, uh, which is how I, I think the, the success that you have been able, able to achieve in, in your plans for the Bandra, or the Carter Road, or even the Juhu scheme. Uh, they are actually uh, early harbingers you know, of a change that we all would like to accept and would like to promote uh, through this kind of activism that we play uh, as uh, professionals in, in the field. 
so I think uh, both our presentations today have brought in uh, extremely valid approaches uh, and shown some positive achieved in our cities and where we don't have to you know go to the other extreme of trying to copy a Dubai or a Singapore or whatever you know in, in other places and we can still uh, go with the people uh, who uh, really need our services and who need to share the ecology as parts of the, uh, the nature itself and, and become uh, participatory in that respect while respecting environment while respecting ecology and uh, various basic prerogatives that our cities need to readdress. Uh, so, uh, I think from here we will go on to uh, people who want to ask questions because I think in the chat we have received some of the uh, you know, encouraging signals where people are uh, liking the discussion that is happening, the presentation and the case studies that have been shown so far. And uh, let me come to you, uh, Sunila, you know, because uh, the four aspects that you based your presentation on which was the hydrology, the beach uh, gentrification that is happening, the development plans that are uh, taking place and the community mobilization where you showed your most successful, uh, the biggest low income housing project of Orangi. Uh, so how long has the Orangi project been going? And uh, uh, I mean, what is the number of people, you know, that are being housed in, in that? Can you give us some indications on this? Yeah. It started out uh, in uh, 1980s um, as basically uh, an infrastructure uh, development project which where sewage lines were laid. It was because it started out as an informal settlement, so there was no uh, proper sewage lines. So uh, through uh, this project, uh, which uh, Dr. Akhtar Hamid Khan uh, envisaged, uh, uh, the communities were mobilized and it, it was a population of 100,000 people at that time. Um, it is estimated that it has uh, reached almost 300,000 people now, but because we haven't had um, any census uh, uh, since 1998, so we don't know the exact numbers, but that's an estimation that it has uh, now uh, 300,000 people live over there um, within that area. And the outfall of this project has been after the laying of these uh, sewage lines, um, they have actually ventured out into other um, projects, the Orangi pilot project. Uh, they have developed a research and training institute where they teach um, uh, uh, young um, uh, people who have just uh, finished high school um, mapping uh, and documentation um, uh, and other uh, uh, survey techniques uh, and other uh, very basic uh, construction techniques. Um, there are also e economic outfalls in the sense that uh, the, because now these, um, uh, these, this low income settlement has become easy accessible so uh, people get businesses to their houses like um, you know uh, 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 factory workers uh, factory owners can reach there get, give out the material for the cottage locally uh, operating cottage industries um, uh, a number of houses have tuition centers uh, uh, within themselves where uh, people can now approach these houses previously because there was so much uh, sewerage and um, uh, the accessibility was so poor that even the economic um, uh, status was very poor. So it, through a physical intervention, there has been economic and social upgradation as well. Because obviously when they can earn better, they become socially upwardly mobile as well. So it is all very much connected that um, although it started out as a very much a physical project, but it led to improvement of livelihoods uh, in the longer run. That's, that's wonderful, actually. It's a very, very positive way of actually going about it. And, I, and what I like about it is the gradual nature in which it has organically grown. I'm sure just as PK said about the community's involvement as building up various relationships within the community that fosters not just economic development, but also imparting of skills or there is other uh, social skills that are shared by people and that gradually helps the entire community as, as at large grow. Uh, so is it a government project or uh, are there any private initiatives also involved in it? Um, it's basically uh, led by a, a community-based organization. 
uh, but uh, the locals, uh, uh, local uh, sewerage were uh, sewerage lines were laid by uh, the community-based organization. But uh, the main sewer connection was obviously done through the involvement of the government. Um, so, so they when they finished, uh, they would finish one or two lanes, then they would connect it to the main sewerage lines. So, yes, the government was involved, but. Um, uh, not um, at, at a later stage, and it was basically initiated, conceived, uh, operationalized by a uh, CBO. I see, I see. Yeah. And the land, I mean, the land, how was the land uh, bank managed? You know, because I think that becomes one of the most critical areas where uh, ownership plays a vital role. Uh, yes, so how it uh, usually works in Karachi is uh, that uh, it starts out as an informal settlement, but once the uh, settlement has consolidated and there are enough number of people and the housing stock uh, has converted from a kacha to a pakka housing stock, so they apply for a lease and normally they get a lease to the land and they, uh, it converts into a formal area. So although it started out as an informal locality, over the years it has been able to apply for lease and now it has converted into formal uh, legalized um, uh, area and they have proper papers uh, but it still remains a low income settlement so the major the uh, population living there is still a, a, a low income settlement uh, may i may i just add a little bit to um, what you said yes please is that okay kiran yeah 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 go ahead uh, pk yeah a very important um, sort of point here that in any of these um, people's movements, uh, effort is not to uh, exclude the government, uh, but to force them in to take the responsibility. Uh, they are our government, and it is their primary job and responsibility to undertake social development works. So at some point, a part of the success of these movements is how we kind of uh, allow a collaboration and take over by this by the government and government agencies to manage financially and in terms of infrastructure provision which is beyond the capacity of any people or private agency so i think that's that's very important um, i do not wish to champion an isolated CBO or NGO effort as being a model, unless these collaborations can be effected at some point of the movement. True, true, yeah. Yeah. Sunil, are you want to say something on that? No, I totally agree because I think uh, at the end of the day, if it's a uh, elected government, uh, uh, you know, as P.K. Dar said, that it is basically our government. And uh, with the devolution plan in place, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, representation from the local councillors. And there would be somebody living in our neighborhood, and, you know, uh, we would know them. Um, but, um, uh, uh, and also, I think that when the government sees such initiatives coming from the community, they are more than willing to help out and connect and support. Um, but I think the initial uh, push or the trust sometimes needs to come from the community and they need to show that they are well organized, well prepared, they know what they're talking about um, and ha are, are equipped with the right uh, intentions, basically. And have the power to question and intervene yeah. in decisions that governments which affect their lives. That's the point. <clears throat> Yeah, yeah. Uh, let me come to you, uh, PK, over uh, uh, some of your projects that you did show us, and where uh, largely there were uh, community leaders, you know, like uh, Shabana Nazmi or uh, her husband, you know, who uh, were part of the important sort of uh, uh, leaders of, of the community there, and probably the community also had accepted them. And uh, at one point in time, did you come or did you initiate a project where the people were later involved or how, how did it go, you know, with your cases? Well, I tell mm -hmm. Javed Akhtar that he is Shabana Azmi's husband. <laughs> yes. He's no other than Javed Akhtar. 
<laughs> okay <laughs> that, that's um well it's it's you know very difficult to answer your question in a short time it's it's never a linear process um though um, though important people uh, eminent people uh, contribute significantly to people's movements and in putting forward the demands of communities to the government uh, ultimately at the end of the day it's also about how closely these individuals intermingle and network with the collective and in this these some of these instances of public spaces development and including one of the largest rehabilitation projects in india and probably in asia as large as orangi project uh, where we rehabilitated over uh, 15000 families um, onto a housing project where shaban azmi also participated actively being a, a member of our organization um, it is it is these collective efforts that really worked uh, magically uh, in both instances in all these instances um so therefore it's a very complex process that evolves through the movement you cannot prescribe the courses or the direction of a movement nor champion one example over the other but it's it's how the movement develops through its own dynamics of engagement and experience and the knowledge that it acquires in that process of collectivization so i think i'd sort of answer you in in that limited yes, manner yes yes i i get the point yes it's a it's a very organic sort of process that uh, evolves across the project time isn't it yeah right yeah. Uh, so uh, vinita can you take over from there i mean can you uh, answer some of the chats that are being put up there in, on this on the chat uh, this thing just a line to conclude before she takes over yes there are yes. normally say Shabana Azmi and Javed Akhtar both individually in the, in the different projects where they were engaged have not just contributed through the funds of their MP lad for these projects which made it possible uh, both in Juhu and Bandra uh, but also were activists with movement and that's their credibility that's their contribution and i thank them for that effort as well <clears throat> sorry <clears throat> sure thanks uh, thank you so much uh, pk actually i do have a question to you uh, pk because um, um most of the projects you described were on the western front but mumbai does have an eastern exposure as well which um you know there's i know you've been um, uh you know you had some uh, opinions on on opening up the eastern waterfront as public space uh and um i just wonder if you could comment on that because that faces the creek not the seaside so wondered if you had any eastern waterfronts as well i should not i cannot uh there are many others who are participating and engaging actively with those waterfronts uh what i showed you is just few kilometers maybe 20 kilometers 15 kilometers of the west of the 56 kilometers or 60 kilometers of mumbai's waterfront so if i miss some area it's uh, it's you know it's everybody has to come in many other architects planners have to come in so i have not really deeply engaged with the eastern waterfront but the eastern waterfront has largely been barricaded uh for since the beginning as being the harbor uh, or the ports and defense establishments and currently there has been a lot of struggle and effort by residents and organizations to reclaim the eastern waterfront as as well uh you know so that's the short of it but my very quick thought is that um you know from our experiences in mumbai of how land and resources very quickly get colonized by private developers uh, through this incredible commitment of our government towards privatization uh, that i fear that we saw uh, in the case of over 500 acres of the mill lands uh, struggle 
uh, that the entire 500 acres just were depleted with very, very little um, uh, trickle of it coming to public uh, benefit or public access. Uh, then my fear is that till a such time, uh, movements of people have not developed to capture these spaces and reclaim uh, these areas, uh, that only through formal me planning mechanism, it's not adequate uh, to claim these lands. Uh, because they will very quickly be converted into private domain um, uh, you know, developments. Uh, there would be more commercial buildings, there'll be more office complexes, there'll be more exclusive developments, and soon uh, the public agenda would be completely lost in that process. I don't know how well prepared we are as movements in the city of Mumbai to have effectively put forward comprehensive ideas. Uh, through collective effort um, for the Eastern Waterfront. So that's my only um, sort of point at this point of time. Sure. The subject of another... I'm not engaged. Uh -huh. I think this will be the subject of another Zoom call, possibly. There was a question from, uh, from Tareem uh, Fatima. Uh, yeah. um, uh, Tareem, uh, is the question answered uh, or would you still like to... Um, explore this further because she wants to she wants to know how to involve locals into projects as you showed in Bandra. Um, so if, if you're if you're still there Tareem if you want to unmute and and uh, see if you see you want to, the question answer. Um, yeah I guess she, she may have left so um, um, I think uh, Let's move on to Sunila because there is a, question, a couple of questions. Uh, Maliha has questions. Uh, she says uh, she doesn't mind if you answer them personally, but um, uh, and uh, just wondered. She wonders how much um, can uh, can um, can OPP help the Orangi pilot project help the residents of Orangi in terms of infrastructure. Uh, or does the OPP consider the prerogative of the government? Uh, and I think you answered that, but there was a further question saying, there are so many ethnicities like Biharis and Pashtuns uh, housed in the Orangi, and how cooperative are the people living in Orangi with the OPP in terms of development of the area? So, uh, and then there's, so the issue of ethnicity, is that something you'd like to quickly answer, Sunila? Yeah, actually, I already answered that in private chat, but uh, I'll repeat it again here. Basically, what I told her is that um, ethnicity does impact uh, the workings uh, and the overall dynamics of the locality because obviously uh, it becomes um, a, 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 a you know a, a point of contention, a bone of contention. Uh, but because o OPP, uh, uh, the institute itself is not ethnically active or is not uh, basically um, um, you know ethnicity uh, supporting any one particular ethnicity so they do continue to work but of uh, but obviously when the law and order situation is poor or um, there are other uh, dynamics uh, which are become challenging then uh, the daily workings do get impacted so i wouldn't deny that it isn't impacted at all um, but having said that because Parveen Rehman, the, the architect who was actually heading or Orangi pilot project, was murdered in 2013, and now her sister heads it. Uh, so that um, in itself has been a big blow as well um, to the workings because she was um, a different personality, a different, um, you know, a different um, vision, a, a, a very, very uh, enthusiastic, dynamic person. Um, but uh, I think OPP has really uh, done its job over the years. It has set a very good uh, model, um, and it is also has also been replicated in other cities of Pakistan. Um, this this model of uh, self help empowerment, uh, community empowerment, connection, a bottom up approach, as Speaker Das said, um, it has executed it very uh, successfully, mm -hmm. and it has set that uh, precedence. Um, uh, so even if it's uh, 
uh, daily workings do get affected because of these issues like security, ethnicity, um, the, the head no longer being there. Uh, but still, uh, it keeps, uh, you know, it does uh, contribute positively to everyday life. And it does uh, help. It is there as an institution to help out anybody who would want to reach. Thank you. Um, Rosina had a comment, which is quite interesting, and it's, it's on the chat. Uh, but I just wondered now, it, it would be good to open it up to a question if you want to unmute and, and ask questions uh, of either of the speakers. Uh, we can do that now. Hi. Thank you for, um, yeah, for, for commenting on that. I was just going to, yeah, I, I'm first want to say thank you. It's been really incredible insights and presentations from both cities. Um, I wanted to ask actually, how easy would it be to create a framework, even if there is a bottom up movement to create and reach out to multi stakeholders, to create a kind of task force as such? I know some things like this could take time, but do you see, and I ask this to both cities, um, would you see this as being possible um, only because I'm, I'm based here in Brussels in Belgium with a Scottish accent, yet yeah, origins uh, from Asia, so, so it's a little bit of a mix there. But um, we've really seen this municipalism, the neighbourhood um, committees and a lot of initiatives happening bottom up. Yet, there has been an interest, certainly for local government and local municipalities to then step in. So I was wondering, would you see that as a kind of co-governance option? Is this I question? pose that to both speakers. Well, I think uh, if... Can I take this question first? Yes, um, yes. please go ahead, PK. Yeah. It's a very complex uh, issue and a very complex question too. Uh, uh, the point is that um, the bottom-up process has many contradictions and conflicts within it, um, as every movement has many questions for itself. It has many challenges within its own dynamics and many contradictions within, which the struggles have to continuously battle with as much as the battle uh, with the others outside the movement. Um, for example, when we talk about bottom-up, how truly is it bottom-up in terms of integration of the diversity of people uh, and how effectively it has been, uh, it has succeeded in uniting the, uh, the excluded the marginalized people uh, in every neighborhood that we are talking about uh, or championing as, the, as a process of bottom-up uh, planning uh, in the city. Um, it, that's a very complex question. For example, um, the, uh, sometime back there was this discussion about gender equality and, the, and gender equality is not just about participation of women but even participation of women, which is significant to the idea of gender equality, uh, again, throws up many, many critical questions uh, uh, of the inner contradictions of marginalized women versus the privileged and the dominant women groups, uh, women's groups. So this happens across, for example, how effectively have slum dwellers or the fishing communities been brought into the so-called public dialogues that I was championing uh, and proudly announcing as a measure of success in all these projects uh, in, into the decision-making process. Um, did they come in initially? Did they back out through the process? They couldn't relate to them. Why couldn't they relate to them? Why couldn't their participation be sustained throughout the process? Was the, pro was the movement led then by the uh, upper middle class, upper class people who aspire to have these beautified spaces, uh, barricade them, create more barricaded spaces across cities. So one of our struggles is really this, is these inner contradictions and struggles of the movements themselves or within movements themselves. The idea of de-walling the city, the idea of 
demolishing these hierarchies and exclusions. Uh, that really, to me, is a big point that I'm just leaving it yet as another question to the question that was asked. And to say that, yes, there is no one answer that I, we could say or I can say or the movements can say is surely um, a prescription. They evolve and they must evolve, otherwise movements would die. The nourishment of movements is only through its evolution into a larger democratic uh, uh, value of achieving equality. I think that's, to me, the big question. Um, Sunita, so did you have a response? Um, or can, should I move on to another um, I Yeah, I can say something, but I don't know how uh, directly relevant it would be to the question. But I also believe that uh, one of the reasons for having uh, the, the uh, struggles that we are faced with today are also because um, of uh, the colonial history that we have had, where we have actually had uh, this, uh, um, you know, non-inclusive way of being governed, um, or, or, you know, uh, the, the locals are not valued enough or um, they, the laws and the bylaws and the policies are uh, brought down and forced upon. Uh, and some of these uh, colonial old um, bylaws are actually what uh, policies are actually what uh, govern or what are still used in our context. Um, so, so I think uh, there, is, there is a requirement for uh, looking at um, uh, re -revalu revamping, revaluing uh, those bylaws as well because um, they are not very inclusive in their own uh, nature. Um, so even if, a, if, even if a master plan is drawn, even if a policy document is drawn, even if these focus groups are conducted where the locals are represented, but how much of that uh, demand or their requirement is actually internalized by um, the people who are finally executing this, uh, uh, pro these projects? That, I think, becomes very crucial to understand. Because um, you know, on paper, you would be calling these uh, focus groups and stakeholder uh, uh, participation by fishermen community and other local representatives. But um, do you really include the, their demands and their desires in the final designs or the outcomes of the project? So I think, um, again, uh, it, it becomes um, different levels of analysis and different tiers. Um, right, starting right at the policy document and uh, going down right at to the um, final implementation. Thank you so much. There was a question from Indra Munshi, and then um, Asif, did you have a question as well? Maybe you can take them both together. So uh, Indra first, Indra Munshi, and then uh, tell us where you're from, Indra. I'm unmuting my mic. Oh, Indra, in, unmute yourself, please. I threatened his saying, I'm unmuting my mic. Indra, can you uh, unmute yourself? She's left. Mute. Ah, okay. She's just okay. There. Okay. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, thank you for the very, very interesting and inspired two presentations. I know P.K. Das's work quite closely, but I am delighted to have the uh, other lecture presented by Sunila so well, uh, Sunila Ahmad so well. Uh, anyway, mine is not a, not a question, but just a comment um, that, you know, part of the ecological and people-friendly city making or city designing is uh, what uh, Patrick Geddes, this uh, Scottish urban uh, so uh, sociologist planner, uh, called making of citizens. And for him, this was extremely important uh, that education must include uh, making good citizens who would then build cities around them, regions around them, 
into what is desirable for a good quality of life. And this education was not to be just for students of architecture or of uh, planning, but this was to be for all. And as a sociologist, I am also a sociologist. He thought that that was the role that sociologists could play in actually making people conscious of their responsibility to their cities, to their small areas, which both presentations talked about, small areas where people are involved in making it a more habitable, a more uh, beautiful place, not in the sense of beautification, but of quality of life. So therefore, I think it is really important that along with these struggles, along, along with these ideas, that actually the education for city building, for making good citizens who would demand rights, but who would also take responsibilities, be made part of the agenda. And if it is inculcated right from the very start, uh, you know, right from, let's say, college teachers or university students, uh, it certainly will make for better uh, cities. Thank you very much. Just a comment. PK, uh, did you want to respond quickly to that or uh, Sunila before I move to ask you? not really uh, respond, but maybe add a little bit um, to what Indra has said. Mm -hmm. And that public education mm -hmm. cannot, does not necessarily in any way mean uh, people going to schools to study architecture, urban planning, or sociology or geography. But one of the uh, ways to democratize knowledge is probably through um, public dialogue and campaigns, uh, where you demolish these hierarchies of ways of learning and educating uh, oneself and others uh, collectively. Um, so for me, um, this ground campaign and wider dialogues uh, is significant to uh, add a point to what Indra was saying. Uh, of course, that doesn't mean that you, those who desire shouldn't study through formal education processes. <laughs> uh, but, but, but this is um, a point just I'm adding to Indra's uh, view. Uh, Sunila, is there any, um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about where this dialogue could occur? Like, you know, what are the, some of the forums uh, that uh, the dialogues could occur? Because you're, you're an educator yeah. yourself. But, uh, um, yeah. When I was doing my um, PhD and I was actually looking at localness, so um, I engaged with a few school students, school going children and, you know, young teenagers. And I was trying to uh, get from them that how do they envisage their cities. And so I thought that, uh, you know, they, that is one forum which becomes very important what, what Indra is actually talking about um, at the very primary level of education where you make them responsive citizens and you um, uh, inculcate in them the ownership of um, uh, of uh, the city um, and also at home I think uh, being a mother you know mm -hmm. just simple things like not throwing your garbage uh, on the street mm -hmm. or at least mm -hmm. knowing where the garbage that you're producing on a daily basis where is it going where does it end up um, education about recycling about sorting at source uh, making a kitchen garden uh, very very basic stuff but I think these little little steps can also contribute to a larger change because you know um i i um I, I, I live in, a, in an apartment and I have planted uh, um, some vegetables on the treetop, uh, on the rooftop, sorry. Uh, and when I, uh, when I share those images with my friends, they are so fascinated by it. But I think it's such a simple thing. Why can't anybody and everybody do this? It is not difficult at all growing some, you know, kitchen, making a kitchen garden. So these, I think, are very small minor steps. Like when I teach environment to my first year architecture students, the first thing I tell them to do is to to, um, download the app of a water calculator and just calculate how much water they use every day. And they, they are surprised by how much water they are wasting every day. So I think um, these, mm. these 
small, small little little steps uh, make responsible uh, citizens and a hopefully and responsible generation. May I add another point to uh, what both of them talked about, Indira, and you talk about um, Sunila, um, which is a very big subject, but I just leave that as a point for future uh, thinking and discussion. How can those who have acquired formal education and skills in whichever field they are, uh, in my case, let's say an architect, how can an architect evolve new languages uh, away from what formal training has taught me to be able to communicate to people in the most simple way? Because architects, for example, are trained to do sophisticated presentations in boardrooms through PowerPoints. When you sit with people, maybe some of those techniques alienate them. A lot of people even don't know how to read a map or a plan. So how can we evolve new languages of communication? And that remains a challenge. And that's the reason why I keep saying that all of us who educated through formal uh, institutions have to join people's movements to evolve these new languages and skills of communication so we can also add and enrich the dialogues and the public knowledge uh, dissipation. So that's, that's for me has always been a struggle as an architect, a formally trained architect. Thank you so much. It is, uh, can we move on to Asif? Um, Asif, uh, uh, who is um, you know, participating all the way from Dhaka. So please carry on. Uh, hello. Uh, so I'm. Uh, thank you, Vinita, for introducing me to the crowd. It's uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. Uh, actually, the question I was about to ask has already been answered. So I would also like to add something to that. Uh, the question of reaching out to people has always been a challenge for architects. I have uh, throughout my academic years, I have faced that because I have been through some projects that required that particular phase. And in Dhaka. Uh, the detailed area plan, we call it DAP here. So this DAP was developed recently and uh, there were some queries of general people, especially architects are raising questions about that. So the government actually uh, arranged some form of formal public hearing of that plan. But the thing is nobody kind of turned up because we did not have enough measures to reach out to people and to make them understand what is at stake here. What is the point of doing a detailed area plan or things like this. Now, the discussion we have had here today actually focused on that, that when we are not thinking uh, from a bird's eye perspective, from uh, 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 projects impact to the whole city, we're actually harming the city in a way where only few people are getting the stakes of the projects. So. Uh, another thing I was involved in my student life was an outreach program where we taught young people about science education and the importance of science, science education when they grow up. Because the rate of people picking science as their stream of education has dropped recently in Bangladesh. When I combine the experiences, I personally think that it is a good move if we encourage young minds, especially young people from middle school to uh, university early ages to take these issues seriously. So my question would be, how can we actually do that? How can we uh, engage to a much younger generation? Because as uh, PKSR has already mentioned that we struggle with technical jargons, the, the people who are educated in uh, technical education sectors like architecture, urban planning, or even engineering. So how can we actually do that? Can I respond to a uh, very quickly? I think a cross-disciplinary um, uh, education really helps there because if uh, if an anthropologist um, is teaching uh, a course in architecture or a sociologist is teaching a course in architecture or, or a ge geographer is teaching uh, some courses in architecture, um, so that kind of uh, gives a different way of looking at a city from a different point, point of uh, vantage point and a different at a different scale and uh, that is what i think um, 
the, these uh, community-led projects, that is why they have been successful also, because these architects actually converted uh, into anthropologists and went into the communities, lived there, understood them, engaged with them, and then they came up with these solutions that were um, the best solutions for them. So I think that is one way of kind of restructuring the uh, any educational curriculum where we see that it is too distant from the community and involve um, disciplines which are more involved, more engaged with communities and have those professionals come in and engage with the uh, uh, students. One way of doing it. Thank you so much. Uh, I would actually want to add a reverse psychology to this. Uh, so if anthropologists, geologists, or zoologists, if they're coming to architecture schools and taking course of architectures to make architects understand more about the thing that are going on, I think uh, it can also be a good idea if architects go to other uh, disciplines as well to do this. Because the way we think, I think we should convey that inside the education system as well. Uh, overall, I think that's a very good answer to my question. We have room for one more question before, uh, before we close. So if anybody uh, would like to pose a question. Uh, um, if not, um, if not, I'd like to hand over to um, Asba, uh, who is uh, the co-curator and co-host of this event. Uh, she's um, an alumnus of Punjab University of College of Art and Design and uh, a very determined uh, architect concerned with shaping environment and infrastructure, social impact and benefit. And uh, she's um, been uh, instrumental in uh, uh, the founding of Peacemakers Pakistani, which is uh, our affiliate in Pakistan, Placemaking India's affiliate in Pakistan. And um, she's um, done a number of interesting projects there, uh, including, um, uh, you know, um, bringing life to underutilized open spaces and uh, done a campaign uh, titled Fun with Trash in different schools to educate uh, younger people in, in uh, Pakistan to be mindful of their waste generation. And so I'd like to um, hand over to Asba to, to wrap up. Uh, if there are any takeaways that uh, she, she would like to highlight, um, that would be great. And then to just close the event. Thank you. Over to you, Asba. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for uh, organizing this event. And yes, thank you for, to both presenters and especially ma'am Sunila for presenting, for preparing this presentation in such so a short period of time and presenting it so well. And yes, uh, the theme for this presentation and for this webinar was basically why to understand why there is a need for the advocacy of to, proje to protect our city's natural assets from privatization and the role of private privatization in global climate change. And yes, we have learned that how architects and urbanists can play an amazing role as an activist to protect the city assets through their participation, right? So before I conclude with the lesson we learned today, I would like to share some personal story here, if you allow. So yeah, basically the purpose and the courage from where I started Peacemakers Pakistani came from my personal experience and a case study visit in a colony in Lahore. And it was a slum area and I was there and I was just, as I entered, I was asked, like, as a student, I was asked, like, uh, ma'am, are you here to make changes for us? Are you here to make better, better area for our colony? And I was like, okay, I was there just for a privatized project case study. And I was thinking, how do I answer this person? And he was younger than me and he was a young boy, basically. So yeah, I just moved through that place and I was, and I just lost the entire project purpose and I was working through that project. What, what can I do to, what can I do for these people? So yeah, that's where the courage came from. And now our recent project that we did, we have been working on for since last year was the Fun with Trash campaign. And we have been reaching out to schools which are working in the slum areas, 
for the student for the children of slum areas people and they are educating them and for that we worked on a creative project and we teach we just interacted with students and we just taught them how they can be aware of their trash and how can they utilize the solid waste and which can be recycled and can be used for their creative purposes and they can just make their school look better that's how we just uh, in uh, we just in uh, um, we just has the communication with them and yes so that point what what has been raised uh, just now that how the architects can learn to communicate with people or with the uh, with people and with children especially we just i just have my my juniors who are students in the punjab university and i just took them there and i just talk tell all them just talk to students and they will teach you what they want and and how they want learn their language and that's how we have uh, done three successful projects and it was a school transformation project using solid uh, using the recyclable materials and yes it was a fun project and we are uh, working with more schools and trying to educate them and we, that can be one approach as well like just create campaigns and go to schools schools are very willing to work on projects like these the creative projects so heading on towards this concluding the lessons okay as an architect urbanist and a place making leader what i have seen till now is that we are more focused more uh, the practitioners are more focused on how to reimagine or how to reimagine our cities on a greater level on master plan level but i think the first step should be identify the reason or the cause why you want to do it or what you want to protect or what you want to advocate for like re invigorate or the climate changes or anything that you have and just try to focus on that and then see which areas you can work on which is and then bring the people into discussion like the speak have said collective engagement of citizens you have a topic you have a reason to protect you have a climate change issue and then reverse that with the people on how to make how to engage them it's not basically about how to engage them it's like giving them a discussion to do and then ask them to share their vision or share their participation or role what do they think hear them out ask for their opinions people will talk people want to talk just give them a good topic to talk about and then with their participation then revision your uh, city or let's say space from space and then move on to big projects like this uh, there is a principle in place making about 10 places with the 10 things to do 10 plus things to do and then these 10 plus places with the will arise to 10 plus destinations and that will be a successful city you use that formula to achieve a good a good or successful city that works uh, on sustainable level okay and yes three points are green vigorate and climate changes or whatever you focus on a problem and then you have a collective engagement of citizens over that and then revision and then integrate that through plans and execute whatever you want to execute that's how i come to this session and this was our talk about and yes i just uh, applaud these two activists who are working very who have worked so well and are continuing to work thank you so much for contributing to their to your cities and to the world thank you thank you asba this is actually uh, a year uh, of of um, this is actually launching this event uh, um, a year to place making india week which will happen in december first week 2021 2021 uh, we had to postpone this year's event on account of covid uh, because the local government regional government in mangaluru uh, was so absorbed with covid duties and you know obviously it just wouldn't have been right to organize it at this time it is a live event but uh, we look forward to your engagement for next year's event which is on the theme of water site place making and um, we'd like to invite uh, a lot of uh, people from all over south asia to come and attend uh, including pakistan bangladesh and um, with that i'd like to um, close the session you can keep in touch with us uh, at uh, www. 
place making India at uh, gmail and um, sorry dot org uh, that has the e e email ID uh, where you can contact us and if uh, Asba you want to um, sorry if, if you want to post your uh, blog as well the a peacemakers Pakistani blog on the chat that would be that would be good and then we can close the meeting yeah sure uh, you can find you can find me on Peacemakers Pakistani and all the social media except Facebook. There is the name called Place Making in Pakistan. You can find me there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both for your participation, Sunila and PK Das. Um, it was so invaluable and people have, you know, uh, uh, said that they found it very interesting and uh, very insightful. So uh, we hope to Continue on this dialogue at some other, at future point. Maybe have some, you know, cross cross border cooperation on this. Uh, on this very valuable subject. Yeah. If, uh, I think there's scope for doing that, and we'd like to hear about other cities that people want to hear about. You know, there could be other cities, possibly Islamabad and Chandigarh. Uh, that's something we've discussed, uh, Azba and I. Uh, perhaps you'd like a session on, on those two cities. So do uh, feedback any uh, suggestions you may have. Thank you so much. And thank you for spending uh, the rest of you. Thank you for spending your Saturday evening with us, choosing to do that among all the things you could have done. And uh, look forward to seeing you at another event. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Asba and Dhania, you're also online, so. Uh, yeah, should I leave good. the meeting now? Uh, should I leave the meeting now, yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, what I'm gonna do is uh, when this um, recording ends,